more liquidity, you have more ability for larger investors to come in, there's less risk. Bitcoin actually has to change hands. It causes transactions, it causes liquidity in the marketplace. That's the biggest benefit to Bitcoin is this increased liquidity that's going to happen. The ideal goal, I think, of Satoshi, when he wrote the white paper and designed the uh, structure of the algorithm around the halving, was that miners would eventually earn more from transaction fees than the block subsidies. And you combine that with appreciation in the price of Bitcoin, and you get this virtuous rising tide. And so um, in an environment today where Bitcoin's at, you know, 42, 43, um, we're getting six and a quarter Bitcoin per block plus transaction fees. And lately the transaction fees have been averaging anywhere from kind of 0.7 Bitcoin to two Bitcoin, sometimes three Bitcoin. Um, now fast forward to the halving in April and we'll go from six and a quarter Bitcoin in block subsidy to three and an eighth. Now the transaction fees aren't gonna change. So if we're still getting two, three Bitcoin in transaction fees, plus the three and an eighth Bitcoin we get in subsidies, it's almost like we were earning the same block subsidy we were getting before with much lower transaction fees. Because at the beginning of last year, the transaction fees were 0 0.03 Bitcoin. So think about that. And here we are with transaction fees around three Bitcoin, right? That's a hundred fold increase in transaction fees. And that is not negatively impacted by the halving, whereas the block subsidy for miners is. And you can argue from an investor's perspective, in Bitcoin, does the halving really have an impact? Is there a supply shock, et cetera? It really impacts the miners more than anybody else. What is that impact to the miners? Well, essentially your revenue is halved when you think about it on a pure block subsidy perspective. Now, historically, every time there's a halving, price of Bitcoin runs up, more than compensates the miner for the drop in revenues. Um, I think that we are in a slightly different world today, institutional investors with Bitcoin ETFs. We're gonna see a lot of derivative products on these ETFs. You know, you've already seen people applying for uh, short versions of the ETF, leveraged versions of the ETF, all sorts of things like that. Um, so you're gonna have all these ways for people to play Bitcoin and spot Bitcoin will form a part of it. And I think what we'll start to see is less volatility in the price of Bitcoin because the liquidity in the market will increase. And as you know, when you increase liquidity in a market, it actually becomes more stable, becomes more attractive to institutional investors and more money comes in. It's a virtuous cycle. I'm not going to be the one calling for one million dollar Bitcoin at the end of the year. Um, you know, I'm thinking it's going to be a much more modest number. But what I do think is that we're going to after this initial kind of excitement around the ETF, uh, we'll start seeing institutional money start coming in slowly but surely. And um, not dissimilar to other ETFs, it'll, you know, the volumes, transaction volumes and inflows will grow over time, which is all going to be good for Bitcoin. I think that uh, there's a lot of folks who um, they've gotten deeper and deeper into the religion of Bitcoin, you know, hold, Bitcoin's going to go to the moon. Um, I actually think that there's a less likelihood of that today than there was pre-ETF, right? It sounds like, you know, very mm -hmm. similarly, you're saying it. And, and I think that it's important to call out that doesn't mean that capital is not going to flow in and the price is going to go up. Like that is going to happen. It's just not going to be thousands of percent very quickly. It is much more likely to kind of trend over time closer to, you know, maybe the stock market times two or something where, where it is yeah. something that's more manageable. And so it'll still be an outperformer. It's just not going to be what we've seen in the past, but also on the downside, like there's less likelihood of a, you know, 80% drawdown moving forward as well. One unique thing that Bitcoin has that equities don't have uh, is that finite number of Bitcoin. Right. In the equity markets, companies can always issue more stock. They can dilute. And, you know, the Bitcoin miners are famous for that, right? That's how we've grown most of us. So because of the finite number um, and with the halving happening in April, the increase in the supply of Bitcoin will now be less than the increase in the supply of gold in the gold market. And so you could expect, hopefully, um, and again, this is not financial advice, but you could expect that Bitcoin should trend at a higher appreciation rate than gold does 
and be more stable in down markets than gold. And gold is the proverbial inflation hedge, risk hedge. So I, I agree with you. I think it's going to, you know, you won't see these huge swings of two, three hundred percent up and, you know, 75 percent down. I think you'll see more moderated swings and that's going to make it even more attractive to institutional investors. We've already seen liquidity in the market increase, right? So you typically would see on an average day somewhere around one and a half to two million Bitcoin will actually trade. Um, now you're starting to see that number grow because of the ETF. And you're also starting to see trading around the ETFs, right? So what does that mean? Well, you're seeing people exiting Grayscale and then putting money into Invesco or one of the other ones that has lower fees. Bitcoin actually has to change hands. It causes transactions. It causes liquidity in the marketplace. And so all of that is very virtuous for the industry because more liquidity, you have more ability for larger investors to come in. There's less risk. You know, it's the whole reason why people like to invest in stocks or indexes that have a lot of liquidity. There's less risk. You can get in and out guaranteed, right? Um, and so I think that's the biggest benefit to Bitcoin is this increased liquidity that's going to happen. And then the options you have of investing, you know, you have miners, you have micro strategy, you have, you can hold your own spot Bitcoin. Now you have ETFs, then you're going to have the futures market continues to grow. Um, and then you're going to have all these other options to be able to short, long leverage, et cetera, using other ETF products. And you're going to start seeing baskets um, of ETFs where you may have exposure to Bitcoin, you may have exposure to gold, you may have exposure to other things in this basket ETF. And, you know, all of this starts soaking up Bitcoin. And again, limited supply, 21 million, we're you know, pushing on hitting 20 million here soon. And um, it's very exciting times for the industry. It's a time of major maturity, I think, which is the most important part. We don't have a customer. Uh, our customers really are investors. We're looking to generate the maximum return for our investors. So. When you think of Bitcoin uh, mining, the price of Bitcoin and global hash rate are the two uncontrollables that you worry about the most, right? Uh, because they impact your ability to get capital, they impact the price of machines, they price, impact all sorts of things. Um, and then to a lesser extent, the price of energy, right? And that's all about, you can hedge around that, you can do things to kind of solve for that. But what drives the price of Bitcoin? Yeah, global liquidity, the dollar, um, you know, the U.S. dollar uh, is a has a huge correlation to the price of Bitcoin because most of us think of the price of Bitcoin in dollar denominated terms, right? If you're living in Turkey, you're living in Argentina, you're living in Venezuela, you're living in other places like that with high, high inflation, you're not thinking about Bitcoin in dollar terms, you're thinking about Bitcoin in your local currency terms, right? Um, but we as, you know, U.S. miners think about Bitcoin in dollar terms. And so what impacts the price of Bitcoin? Well. High interest rates generate a high return for people that is very safe, right? So your risk-free rate of return in a high interest rate environment is very high, which means higher risk, high growth investment options are less attractive. So that impacts potentially the price of our stock, which impacts our ability to raise capital. You know, risk adjusted, Bitcoin is the best investment going back 10, 15 years that anybody could have. But the question is, are you willing to put up with the risk that you may have these huge drawdowns? Um, and so in a high risk-free return environment, you know, people go risk off and they move to um, things like bonds, et cetera. As interest rates drop, all of a sudden, now you need to capture that yield that you wanted again. So where are you going to get it? You have to then go up the risk curve. And so you're going to go back into equities. You're going to go back into growth stocks and you're going to go into Bitcoin. And so we believe that Bitcoin, unlike gold, is not just a safe haven asset, but it's an asset that generates a very positive return uh, independent of the market conditions. And again, look at Bitcoin's performance over its life. Look at Bitcoin over any kind of period um, greater than two or three years, and it's done very well. And so I think that um, the things that impact us, liquidity, dollar, um, global conflict, you know, risk, impacts us you know today we are in a multipolar world geopolitically there's a lot of um stuff going on that um impacts the dollar it impacts uh inflation right and what's going to control interest rates well it's this combination of inflation and the economy inflation has been tamed 
but it's not fully tamed. There are sectors of the economy that the Fed can't control. Energy is one of them, right? Global trade is another one. And um, with what's going on in the Red Sea, global trade is being impacted, shipping costs are going up, energy prices are going up. That's not something the Fed can control, right? So all of those things roll into uh, things that make Bitcoin more or less attractive um, as Bitcoin price moves up and down, global hash rate moves up and down, right? What is your price prediction for the end of this year? My personal one is I think we're gonna be somewhere, we will hit the all time high sometime in late Q3, early Q4. And then we'll see a sell off. And it may come down to the mid 40s. It may come down to the low 50s. And then it's going to chug along there into early 2025. And then by the end of 25, you may see a new all time high somewhere in the 120 range.